In this video, we're going to talk about populations and population growth and how populations tend to grow. So um, if we look at population growth, we can see that it's basically, the, the symbol uses is little r, which is, stands for the population growth rate, and we calculate that by saying the number of births in the population minus the number of deaths divided by the population. So if I've got 10 births and I've got 5 deaths and I have a population of 100, so I have 10 minus 5 divided by 100 would be a population growth rate of about 5%. Okay. Now we can see populations sometimes grow at a constant rate, but oftentimes they grow at an exponential rate. And sometimes we call this a J curve because it looks like the letter J, but populations as they increase tend to increase not at a constant rate, but sometimes at an ever increasing rate, especially if they've got plenty of resources in the area. So let's talk about why that is. Here's a good example of sandhill cranes. They were reintroduced to the United States in 1940. Um, and as they continued to grow, you can see the population didn't grow at a constant rate, but it grew at a sort of an ever-increasing rate. Now, this didn't happen forever. They have sort of reached a carrying capacity at a sustainable level, but why did this population grow at an ever-increasing or exponential rate? So if we say R is the growth rate, um, the number of individuals added to the population, and the symbol we're going to use for the population is N, so R is the growth rate, and N is the population. Well, every year that population is going to increase by R times N. So the change in population over the change in time is going to be impacted by what the population is. So when we had maybe you know 15 or 20, and we had a population growth rate of say 0.1, that's going to be a pretty small number of individuals added every year. When we get to a population of 200 and we have a growth rate of 0.1, well, that's 20 cranes that are added to the population every year. That's going to be a lot greater increase. So that's why, because the total increase of population depends on the population. We see large populations can grow very, very fast. And you have a population of you know 7 billion humans even though we have a pretty low po population growth rate globally, we're still producing a lot of new humans every year. Okay, so some examples of population growth. We have paramecium here growing, and we have daphnia or water fleas growing. We can see that they don't grow exponentially indefinitely, right? They reach some kind of a level, and that level we call a carrying capacity. That's the amount of individuals that can be supported indefinitely in that given area. Okay. Now the growth that we see, this, sometimes we call this an S-curve, but the mathematical term for it is called logistic growth. It's a, it's a log curve. And the reason for that is the formula we use is so we have the growth rate times the population. That causes exponential growth. But in an area with limited resources and, and limiting factors, we have to multiply that by the carrying capacity minus the population divided by the carrying capacity. So when populations are very low, this number is low relative to this number, so this number is close to 1. As the population gets higher and equals the carrying capacity, this value goes to 0. So if n equals k, this is 0, which means our population levels off and becomes 0. And then we have this 0 population growth, which is what we see in these populations as they reach their carrying capacity due to limiting factors. So let's talk about some strategies that populations can use to maintain their populations. One of them we see in large large mammals, things like uh, apes and elephants. Uh, this is what we call case selection. These are populations that have very, relatively low birth rates, so they try to maintain relatively high high numbers and keep their populations close to carrying capacity. So they're slow growing um, organisms and they need to keep the numbers fairly high. These are also species that are usually endangered because when we go in and destroy habitat or hunt them, they can't rebound. They can't reproduce fast enough to sustain their numbers. The other strategy is called R-selected species. This is kind of the opposite approach. Okay, So R means growth. So these are species that are 
focused on producing a lot of offspring relatively quickly. So imagine species that we might do this, cockroaches, rabbits, dandelions, weedy plants, right? They're going to grow really, really fast. Now a lot of things eat rabbits and roaches, so they're going to suffer high death rates, but that's okay. As long as some survive, they'll be able to produce lots and lots of offspring and maintain their numbers. So our selection, again, high reproductive rate, high death rate, whereas case selection usually has lower death rates, slower growth, and tries to maintain their populations closer to carrying capacity. So what are some of these factors that cause populations to kind of reach their carrying capacity? We call them density dependent factors. So as the population density increases, population goes up but the area they live in stays the same, so the density increases, well, what's going to happen? We're going to have more death due to disease, due to parasitism, due to predation, due to the fact that there's just limited amounts of food. So these flower beetles living in your flower, as their population gets higher and higher, they're going to run out of food. They're going to be living in their own waste. They're going to start to suffer really high death rates because their population is essentially gone beyond what can be supported. So those are examples of density dependent factors. Um, this is an example of negative feedback. So as the population is growing exponentially, more death causes it to level off, to kind of stay within this narrow range, to stay within this carrying capacity. Okay. There's other factors that aren't dependent on the density, and they're called density independent factors. So those are things like natural events, so um, weather hard frost kills all the insects or kills all the, the flowers, right? Um, in the Gulf of Mexico, there's a dead zone that appears every summer. There's no oxygen in the Gulf in the middle of summer in a large part of the Gulf of Mexico, so that can't sustain any fish. They, they fortunately swim to other areas, but you can imagine what would happen if you couldn't swim. You would die without any oxygen. Um, so temperature, oxygen, natural disasters, hurricanes, these are things that will cause massive fluctuations in changes in populations regardless of the population. Okay. A good example of a density dependent relationship is that between predators and prey. And the best example of that is the snowshoe hare and the lynx. So you can see this data that was recorded over 150 years ago as hare populations went up, lynx populations went up. That makes sense. More food for the predators so their populations increased as well. As the predator population goes up the prey population goes down. That makes sense. More predators eating more prey. So that as the prey population goes down, the predator population goes down. And we see these sort of cyclical um, relationships between these two populations, showing that they are both dependent on each other and they are both regulating each other. And this is a good example of negative feedback. They're both keeping the other population in check in this sort of natural predator-prey cycle. Humans, though, we don't have predators, and we don't have, we've yet to really hit our carrying capacity. So if we look at human population growth over the past 10,000 years, looks like exponential growth, right? This little blip in here, anyone remember what that is? That's the plague. Ah, a third of the population died, but we rebounded from that, and we've done really well since. So even like influenza outbreak of 1918, or HIV, they, they, they don't even register in terms of the total number of people on Earth, right? So this looks kind of scary. What is what's happening to the human population? Well, if we look another 100 years down the road, 50, 100, 150 years, we see that the, even the human population is going to level off. It's going to reach equilibrium. Now, it's, we don't really say this is the carrying capacity because we've continued to move our carrying capacity higher and higher on Earth to sustain the you know, 7 billion people <clears throat> that are here now. But we're at least going to reach this equilibrium. And it's not going to be the same in all countries. You can see that Europe is already experiencing negative growth. So um, that their populations are already decreasing. But you can see Africa still increasing pretty rapidly. And other Asia, meaning Asia other than China and India, still increasing fairly rapidly. But we can see by you know, another um, 70, 60, 70 years, those populations will level off and reach so not zero, but zero population growth, so births equaling deaths, and they estimate the global human population will be somewhere between you know, 10 and 11 billion by the time we stabilize. So that's, that's kind of what it's looking like for humans and reaching our sort of equilibrium, we'll say, not carrying capacity. Okay, so human populations can exist in a couple of different ways, right? We can have 
in very poor countries, very underdeveloped countries, high birth rates and high death rates. So Somalia or Rwanda or Burma, um, countries where you know there's a lot of babies being born, but there's a lot of deaths. Well, if they're equal, that's going to be a stable population, zero population growth. Then in other developed countries, like in Europe and in the United States and Japan, we see low birth rates and low death rates. And we have, again, seen zero population growth in many of these sort of first world countries, these developed countries. But what happens when a country like India or a country like Pakistan or um, China moves from a first world country, I'm sorry, a third world country to a first world country. We see what's called a demographic transition. So this occurred in Sweden over the past 300 years where we saw birth rates slowly go down and death rates slowly go down. And during this whole period, since death rates were lower than birth rates, the population increased. Okay. Well, if you look at Mexico, what we see over the past 100 years is the birth rates remained relatively high through most of the 20th century. The death rates went down really fast. We discovered antibiotics. We had all this technological breakthrough, medicine, and so forth. So we were able to really allow Mexicans to live a lot longer, but birth rates remained high because of these cultural ideas about population. So that made for sort of an unstable situation where the population really exploded. So it's in these developing countries really important that we get the the birth rates to come down at an equal rate as the death rates. Otherwise, all this difference between birth and death rate is just massive increase in population. And that can be very destabilizing and cause a big problem in a developing country. The last thing I want to talk about is another thing that can be a sort of problem in countries is the age structure. So how many people are young? How many people are middle-aged? How many people are old? Okay, so if you look at this population here, you see most of the population is very, very young. Very few people are old. So what's going to happen over time is these young people are going to become reproductive age, and they're going to have a lot of babies. And that's going to mean that population is going to really grow very fast. The second population, you can see there's a lot of people, sort of middle-aged people, and fewer people up here, and a good number of people down here. This is a more stable configuration. This, this country is going to be sort of at a stable configuration. And then this one, we can see there's fewer babies down here, young people, and more old people. This is a population that's experiencing maybe zero or negative population. So if we, this first one is an example of Kenya, which is rapidly growing population, or it was 10, 20 years ago. It's kind of leveling off now. This is the United States. Again, these are the baby boomers, the swell, this baby, this is a 10 year old graphic. This is now up here somewhere but the baby boomers are that, that big swell that's moving up, but kind of stable growth. And this third one is uh, Italy, which is zero, and it's actually now negative growth, negative population growth. So these are some interesting sort of <clears throat> demographics to look at to, to predict what's going to happen to human populations. It depends on the age structure, how many young people versus how many old people in the population. Also affects, it depends on birth rate and a lot of other factors. So this is just an overview into populations and population ecology.